Okay, it looks like we're good to go. So once again, welcome Dennis and I'll let you take over. Okay, hello folks. Um, I don't know where I, I left off or you, you left me or I left you. We start heard nothing, but you you start at the beginning. So just start right at the beginning. All right. So uh, <clears throat> let's start with what Herodotus, a Greek historian said 2,500 years ago about Egypt. Egypt is the gift of the Nile. And the illustration that we have here uh, that I, I obviously took from a book, it's not a, a great illustration, but what I wanted you to see is what a narrow thread of life the Nile River Valley represents. Look at the bank here. This very, very narrow strip of fur, well-watered land is what may, has made Egyptian civilization possible for 5,000 years. And that's it. Uh, so we need to start with that uh, recognition. If we look at the Nile Valley from space, uh, again, here is huge areas of desert. And then this thread of green that represents the life-giving water of the Nile River. Another view, uh, again, this shows the Nile as it empties into the Mediterranean. And here in the Delta, of course, there are much, much greater chances for agriculture uh, but it is still relatively small given the total of uh, depression, which again is, is pretty well watered by the Nile. But other than that, this is all desert. And, and it highlights one of the important things about early Egyptian life. <clears throat> and that is Egyptian civilization was really isolated from other major population centers and other major cultures. Of the four earliest civilizations that emerge in the period of time from about 3500 to 2500 BCE, uh, Egypt is perhaps the best isolated from, from uh, any outside influences. To the north, of course, we see the Mediterranean Sea. And while the Mediterranean Sea will become a highway, it won't become a highway for another 15 or 1600 years. Uh, to the well, west of the Nile Valley, we see the Sahara Desert and it, it continues all the way across North Africa. Uh, to the south, so we do see the Nile, but in this Southern area, the Nile is much faster flowing and therefore it cuts a V-shaped valley as opposed to a U-shaped valley, which there is not as much uh, land available for agriculture. So this fast moving Nile is, is not as good uh, for farming. And then finally, there is the East. And of course, the East is the only area in which there is some chance uh, for the, the Nile uh, Valley area to be connected to uh, the Tigris Euphrates River Valley to the East. But it's only this 40 mile strip of land here in the Sinai Peninsula that connects Egypt to the, all of the lands to the east. So all in all, Egypt is relatively uh, isolated. And that gave it safety and security in much of its development. Now, the Nile, of course, is responsible for the agricultural wealth of the river valley. But the Nile also affected uh, Egyptian culture. For example, the Nile had an influence on the calendar. This is because the flood of the Nile is very, very periodic. It's very predictable. And so the Egyptians were able to develop a calendar of 12 months. Now, I used to ask my students, does that make it accurate? Uh, and very often they said yes, but of course, 12 months can be anywhere from 31 to 28 days long, as we know. But they had a calendar of 12 months of 30 days, which is probably accurate, 360 days, but they also knew it was 365 days. But instead of tacking those extra five days onto months here and there, like we do, uh, they, they set them aside for five days of holiday, which I think proves uh, that they were an advanced civilization. Okay, now, uh, the, the flood also required that the valley be resurveyed every year after the flood because the flood is very, very strong. We're not talking about two or three inches of water in the family room. 
we're talking about uh, water that can be eight and, and 10 feet deep in some places. And in fact, water powerful enough in many cases to be able to move boundary markers. As a result, the valley needed to be re every year as each individual got back their land and not an inch more. So uh, all this need to resurvey made the Egyptians develop a significant mathematical and geometric skills so that they could carry out this survey. So the, the Nile is really an, an, an instrument that drives culture as well for the Egyptians. Now, the, the, one of the first figures we run into in Egyptian history is one that uh, I'm afraid you may have heard of often. I thought that many's the time you might have heard of him. You might have heard of Menes. Now, Menes was the king of Upper Egypt, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And he united Upper and Lower Egypt in about 3100 BCE, or a little more than 5,000 years ago. Now, and this is the start of a period in Egyptian history known as the Old Kingdom. Now, Menes was the king of Upper Egypt, and he, he uh, united this with Lower Egypt. And I remember I was going through this once in class, and a student raised us, asked the question, are you telling me that Upper uh, is below Lower? And of course, I said, yes, this is Upper Egypt here at the bottom. And here is Lower Egypt at the top. And he said, doesn't that mean that upper is lower and lower is upper? And then I, I tried to explain that it really has to do with the way the river flows. It, the Nile flows from the south to the north. And the uh, part of any river that is closest to the source, in this case, the southern part of the Nile, is the upper part of a river and the part that is closest to the mouth is the lower part of the river. So I tried explaining that and then he asked, doesn't that mean that it's flowing uphill? And I decided that we'd already spent enough time and I said, come see me after class and, and uh, we'll try and explain this. I, I want to assure you though that the Nile like all rivers flows downhill. So Menes is, is probably a mythic figure it's hard to say that there really was a king by the name of Menes who started the old kingdom. But in any event, the old king kingdom starts in about 3100 BCE and lasts until 2200 BCE. And again, I want to pause for a moment and ask you to think about the time period we're looking at. That's 900 years. So this early period of, of Egyptian history lasts nine centuries. If you go back into the history of the United States, 900 years, well, you go well beyond any point of there being a United States, you go well beyond Columbus, you almost go back to the Norman conquest of England in 1066. That's what a huge period of time it is. And in fact, Egyptian history is really marked by very, very long periods uh, of time. Um, it is in the Old Kingdom that many of the character elements of Egyptian life were formed. It is really these elements that we think of as, as characteristic uh, that, that flow out of the Old Kingdom. Now, after the Old Kingdom, there was a period known as the New King, or the, excuse me, the Middle Kingdom. And it lasts for 300 years from about 2100 to 1800 BCE. Now, again, this is only 300 years. Again, if we go back in, in US history, 300 years, we go back uh, before the Revolutionary War. So uh, this is, again, by our standards, a very, very large period of time. The, uh, the uh, you might be interested in is the New Kingdom or Empire 
and it lasts uh, better than 400 years. After 1100, uh, Egypt is, is very often not independent, but in fact is being, um, being controlled by other powers. So it really loses its independence that it had in the old middle and new kingdom. Now, the central figure in the old kingdom, and again in the middle and in the new, was the pharaoh. And the easiest way to describe the pharaoh is that the pharaoh was the god king of Egypt. That is, he was considered to be a god on earth, and as such, was, um, was the ruler of the people of now, we look at this notion and we can say the words God King, but I doubt that any of us, myself included, believe that literally the Pharaoh was a God on earth. But what about the Egyptians? Did the Egyptians as a God? Well, while we don't know with any certainty, I suspect that the Egyptians did think of him as a God on earth for a number of reasons. First of all, most Egyptians would never, ever have seen the pharaoh. Uh, the, the pharaoh was really um, a figure that, that did not need any public support. He did not need to campaign. Uh, and uh, he was not uh, prone to, to travel among uh, the people. So most Egyptians would never, ever see him. But in addition to that, how would most people know in Egypt from people who were government officials or perhaps a local uh, large landholders? Uh, those two categories are very often the officials, the large landowners and the officials, and, and not their authority from the pharaoh. So if you would ask one of them, is the Pharaoh truly a God? I'm, I'm really convinced that they would say, yes, he is a God. He's absolutely a God. And you should not ever doubt that because they get from the power that flows uh, through the Pharaoh to them. So I think that they really did believe he was a living God on earth. Now, as a type of government, this is a theocracy. A theocracy is governed by a religious leader. And we have that. Now, the person is, oh, by the way, Egyptian. Polytheistic. And that means that to say how many gods they worshipped. Because there were uh, various levels of gods. And the reason for this may be uh, by the, the very way Egypt was created. Um, long before there was a united Egypt, there were dozens, if not hundreds of communities scattered up and down the Nile River Valley. And it is likely that each of these communities developed religious beliefs and religious worship uh, of their own. They may have shared some ideas, some gods, uh, some practices with their neighbors, but there were many, many, many individual religions. As time went by, some communities, more powerful than others, took control of their neighbors. And when they took control of their neighbors, they really had one of two choices. To either allow their neighbors to continue to practice their faith and incorporate their beliefs into the the national belief, or to try and force them to change. And in Egypt, it seems that the, the policy that was followed was simply allowing them to incorporate their beliefs uh, into the, the, the total uh, worship of the gods of Egypt. And so as we look at ancient Egypt, what we see is there, there are gods that might be called the national gods. And we'll single out a few of them later on. Uh, but gods like Isis uh, and uh, Toth and, uh, uh, and Osiris, those would be thought of as national gods. But then there were regional gods. And in fact, there were gods that were simply unique to individual villages. And that's really why 
we'll never get a good count as to how many gods there were in ancient Egypt. And it it's, may not be that important anyway. Now, no matter how powerful the Pharaoh was, he could not personally rule all of Egypt by himself. Every government uh, requires a bureaucracy, a, a set of officials who help to uh, make and enforce uh, the laws of the land. Now, while bureaucracy is universal, who are the bureaucrats? Changes from society to society. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Egypt, what we see is that the bureaucrats were chosen from the landed aristocracy. They were landed aristocrats. And the Pharaoh was faced with a choice in this regard. The landed aristocrats uh, had power, they had wealth based on their land holdings and their position. And the Pharaoh could choose to challenge them or he could try and incorporate them into the ruling structure. And in G Egypt, what we see, Pharaoh to incorporate the landed aristocrats into the ruling structure by making them the local bureaucrats, the, the local individuals responsible for carrying out the law, forcing the law, and carrying out the uh, Pharaoh's commands. Now, this was mutually beneficial because the Pharaohs had this built in set of powerful people to help them. And these powerful people also gained uh, some power of, uh, of their own by being associated with the God King of Egypt. So this was a mutually beneficial system. It wasn't democratic, it wasn't necessarily just, but it, it worked for a very long time. Now, I think when any of us think of ancient Egypt, we think of the pyramids. So what are they? Well, uh, my students would say they are a tomb and I would say a tomb for whom? And of course they are a tomb for the Pharaoh. You see the three pyramids of the Giza group. Uh, this is the pyramid, the, the, it is the greatest of the, the three pyramids, the greatest of all the pyramids, the pyramid of Khufu known to the Greeks as Cheops. How the Greeks got Cheops out of Khufu, I don't know. But this is the very largest of all the pyramids ever built. Now, um, there, there used to be, there was a writer by the name of Eric von Daniken. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, who wrote a series of books, the most notable being one called The Chariot of the Gods, in which he, uh, he said the uh, pyramids just seemed to spring out of the soil of Egypt, uh, that how could the Egyptians in this very early state of civilization uh, make the pyramids? The pyramids, in fact, were uh, made by uh, space travelers. Uh, that they cut all those blocks that made up the pyramid with lasers and so on and so forth. Well, if they did, uh, they, uh, they used lasers that would simulate chisel marks because those stones have chisel marks on them uh, and not neat uh, cuts of, of laser like. Von Daniken uh, really diminished the, uh, the power and the, uh, the cleverness and the hard work of the Egyptians. The pyramids really represented a long development in Egyptian culture. Now, the Egyptians buried their dead in the desert. And if you think about it, it just makes sense. They only had a limited amount of good agricultural land. You're not going to take that good land along the Nile and turn it into cemeteries. And besides that, there was always the chance that during the flood, uh, the bodies might be uh, washed away, and, and that would be um, very embarrassing. So um, they, they buried out in the desert because they had a virtually an infinite supply of desert to use. Now, what happens for any desert burial is that the dryness of the desert desiccates the corpse. It, it naturally dries it out. It naturally tends to mummify the corpse. And the Egyptians began to realize this and began to think that that was probably what they ought to be doing with their dead. They ought to uh, mummify them and bury them in the desert. Now, again, 
there was class and status differences among the Egyptians. And those who could afford it began to build tombs. And there in effect was a race among uh, classes of Egyptians to have the fanciest, the most uh, elaborate tomb possible. Um, this is not particularly uh, uh, restricted to the Egyptians. If you go to any American cemetery, I think you can find a certain amount of competition uh, as to who can have the most uh, impressive uh, tombstone or for that matter, uh, monument. So over time, the tombs in Egypt became more elaborate. They became something known as mastabas, and I'll illustrate this in a minute. The Mastabas then led to the step pyramid. The very first step pyramid was built for the Pharaoh Zasser by his, his architect Imhotep in 2780. And the first true pyramid at Medum was built uh, 180 years later in 2600 BCE. Now, this is a Mastaba, a very simple Mastaba made of sun-baked brick. And it was a structure put over the burial chamber, not necessarily to exactly mark it because they, they were cautious about grave robbers, but somewhere underneath the mastaba would be the, the burial chamber. But again, uh, people like competing and happens. And here's a, a, a view of an actual mastaba that has been excavated. Uh, you can see that the pyramid evolved then as step pyramids, where in effect, what you have is a mastaba and you pile another mastaba on top of it, and then a third and a fourth and a fifth, and you get a pyramid shape, very stable. In fact, if you watch kids in, uh, in preschool uh, playing with blocks, very often one of the first structures they'll build is a pyramid because it is very, very stable. So while this is a sort of pyramid, the step pyramid, uh, it is not a true pyramid. The first true pyramid was the Medum pyramid. And you look at that and that does not look particularly pyramidal. And you're right. Uh, the problem with the Medum pyramid was that the architect built the sides of the pyramid at too steep an angle and the sides just could not support the weight and uh, it, it, the sides collapsed around this stub of a center um, surrounded by all of this rubble. So again, we can see this was a, uh, a process of experimentation and learning. No, no space aliens coming down with a complete set of blueprints and knowing how to do it right off the bat. Then we get the, the true pyramids. And again, this is the Giza group. Uh, and I like this particular shot because I think most of us tend to believe that these pyramids are set out somewhere in, in uh, the, the romantic setting of the desert sands. Uh, whereas you can see that the city of Cairo uh, is encroaching on the pyramids uh, virtually all the time. You can see that uh, the, the city runs almost right up to the, the pyramids and right up to the pyramids parking lot. So uh, I think this gives us a, a contemporary field, field that's uh, interesting. Now, I want to talk to you about how to build a pyramid. And to do so, I am going to uh, use a book by David McCauley uh, entitled Pyramid. And, and in this book, what uh, Mr. Macaulay attempts to do is to show us how the Egyptians built a pyramid. Macaulay is a wonderful uh, writer and artist. Um, he uh, has other books that show us how uh, castles were built, how the Romans built their towns, and on and on. And if you have uh, a young person who is interested in any of these sorts of things, I'd recommend any of Macaulay's books uh, to him. Here you see the pyramid. Here you see a smaller pyramid. We'll talk about that a little later. Here's the river itself and a small temple. Uh, and uh, then there is a mortuary site here. So let's uh, look and see how this happens. Now this would be if we were looking down at a, a blueprint, we would see here by the river itself was a valley temple. This is really a small temple. And I, I think of it 
as a receiving dock because the, the Pharaoh is not going to build a pyramid and then wait right there until he dies. So, so he's conveniently located. He will die someplace else in Egypt and they will have to send his body to the pyramid. The, the body will be taken along this causeway up into the desert area. Again, remember, we don't want to use this good agricultural land to the mortuary temple. And this mortuary temple is where the Pharaoh's body will be prepared for burial. This is a long, long process. It can take 60, 120, or in some cases, even more days to complete. You may also notice that there are these things labeled boat pits around the pyramid. More about that later. Now, the pyramid is solid. Now, these, these structures are not single rocks, but they are layer after layer after layer of stones. Each of these stones would weigh about two and a half tons or 5,000 pounds each. And in the, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, there are about 2.2 million stones that make up this pyramid. So it is uh, very, very uh, large. Uh, there are some filler blocks and then there were the casing stones on the very outside. These were of a very, very fine quality white limestone so that the pyramid gleamed white uh, when it was constructed in, in the, the sun. The only hollow areas, because I had students who thought that the pyramids were basically empty, you know, like, like the uh, former palace or uh, in, in, in the Detroit area. But the only empty areas really is the tomb chamber and of course a tunnel uh, to get to that, perhaps a false tunnel or two to lead grave robbers uh, um, astray. But this is the only hollow area in this whole giant structure. 2,200,000 blocks. Now, we know what sorts of tools were used to make many of them are really quite recognizable. I think we all would recognize these as chisels, the mallet, the hammer, the trowel, the, the tri-square, and, and my particular favorite here is the level. Now, this is a plumb bob level, not a spirit level like uh, most of us use nowadays, but a plumb bob level works perfectly well to make sure things uh, are level. So the, the, the dolerite is a hard, hard stone and it was used to cut channels in softer stone, sandstone and limestone. Here are other tools. And uh, like I said, we know about these tools. The Cairo Museum is filled with literally thousands of examples of these. Here's an ads, uh, here is a plumb rule. Uh, I like the drill here. This is called a bow drill and you steady it on, on the, the mushroom end and then you run the bow back and forth and it rotates It rotates here, the, the drill point. Uh, the saw is recognizable. The thing that may not be quite as recognizable are the boning rods. These are three equally uh, length pieces of wood and a string and you run the string along a surface and then you run the third rod underneath the string and you can easily see low spots or high spots. So uh, it's a way of making sure a surface is flat. Uh, but again, here are the tools. Uh, certainly the Egyptians didn't need any advice from space travelers to come up with these tools, I think. They could have done it all themselves. Now step in building a pyramid may not seem to be the first logical step. The first thing we'll, we're going to do is at our site, make a large circular wall. We will first draw a large circle and we can do that by a peg, a rope and a stick and we can make our large circle and we will build on that circle a wall and we will have in the top of that wall, a water channel. We're going to then use the water in that channel to level the whole wall. So this wall will be perfectly level when it's completed. What next? Well, this wall is necessary for surveying. Um, the, one of the engineers will wait one night until 
uh, a star, any bright star will do, appears over the wall, mark that spot, drop a plumb line to the ground, then wait until the star disappears on the other side of the wall, mark that with a plumb line and make a, an angle to the center. And then <clears throat> true north is the exact middle of this angle. So all we need to do now is bisect this angle, cut it in half. And I used to ask my students uh, how to do this. And I got a lot of people looking at the ceiling and, and, and I carefully taking notes and so on and so forth. But if you go back to your geometry class, you'll remember how to bisect that angle. And this becomes important because it becomes one of the, the founding lines of the pyramid. We, the pyramids are virtually perfectly situated, true north, south, true east, west. And once we get our, our north, south line, we can then do perpendiculars to that for our east, west lines. Now we have this huge area. The pyramid covered more than five acres of land. And what we now need to do is to uh, flatten this area. And the way we're going to do that is the same way uh, we got the wall perfectly flat. We are going to, or rather the Egyptians are going to cut water channels throughout this area running in both directions. Uh, and they will flood each section one by one with water, level that section, go on to the next, go on to the next. Yes, this is labor intensive, and we may even argue that it's tedious. But it, again, it requires low technology and uh, we can level this whole five acres plus uh, of land perfectly flat. We need it perfectly flat because we don't want the pyramid built at an angle, or at least the Pharaoh doesn't. Uh, he doesn't want to be buried in the cockeyed pyramid. The next thing we need is, um, is uh, 2.2 million stones. And they need to be pretty regular. Here you see a crew of stonemasons working on a stone. Now, there was, uh, a, a year round crew of skilled masons that worked producing stones. It may be, have been as many as 2000 men and they would produce as many stones as they could each and every year. It took 20 years to produce enough stones to build the great pyramid. By the way, you may notice something written on this particular stone. And the writing uh, is, is interesting in and of itself. Uh, the writing tends to indicate one of two things. In some cases, it seems to be a locator mark and it will tell uh, people where that stone fits into the pyramid. So in one sense, the pyramid may have been a large, very large pre-numbered kit. In other cases, um, it is an identification mark of the particular crew that made the stone because these masons were paid on a piecework basis. And so you needed to uh, be able to identify each and every stone you produced. And so you would in effect sign it. This of course also became a quality control issue because if the stone was out of square, then the uh, supervisors knew who produced that stone and knew not to pay them for it. So it's very clever. And in fact, mo most of the people who worked on the pyramids were in fact uh, paid labor, uh, paid in some way or another. The skilled craftsmen uh, were paid pretty much as we understand that word, um, but the pyramids were not built by slaves. Uh, <clears throat> and the reasons are simple. Um, in the ancient world, there were two major sources of slaves. One was people guilty of serious criminal offenses. And the other was prisoners captured in war. Very often captured prisoners of war were enslaved as a result of their defeat. 
But remember, Egypt was isolated from other major population centers. And in fact, uh, did not go to war very often, particularly in the Old Kingdom. Uh, and as a result, no wars meant no prisoners of war, which meant that was not a viable source of slaves. And again, in terms of people guilty of serious criminal offenses in any society, that's a relatively small number of people. And so there were not many slaves in Egypt at all. So you had to find another source of labor. And that source of labor came about when the Nile flooded. The Nile flooded from, from side to side every year for about four months. And that meant there were huge manpower shortages that were out of work for about four months every year. And it seems that the pharaohs mobilized this manpower to provide the muscle energy to build the pyramids. Now, we think that, that these men got little more uh, than room and board. And, and uh, in, in the last 20, 30 years, there have been great fines uh, uh, by the Giza group of uh, dormitories uh, for people to stay in, of uh, uh, great uh, bakeries uh, that, that produced uh, thousands of loaves of bread every day to help feed the people. And it is these people during the flood, uh, perhaps mobilizing as many as 80,000 men to provide the, the raw labor to, uh, to build the pyramid. Because once we have the stones, we have to put them in place. Now, the Egyptians did not use wheels, but in fact, what they did was load the stones on sleds. You know, if I ask you to move a 5,000 pound stone by yourself, you would think I was foolish. And in fact, I would be. Um, but if I ask you to move a hundred pounds on a sled, I'm pretty sure you could do that. And so the Egyptians had sleds and could move the stones on them. You put 50 men on ropes, pulling the sled. In effect, each man is pulling a hundred pounds of weight. If that's still too much, put 60 men and it reduces it further. So obviously the first layer of stones was the easiest to put in place. You know. <clears throat> Every subsequent layer became harder and harder to place because the subsequent layers had to be put on top of the preceding layer. And again, we believe that the Egyptians did this by building ramps. The easiest way to go up is to uh, spread the work of going up over a distance, to use a ramp or an inclined plane. That's why inclined planes are part of burial free, uh, barrier free design, excuse me. Uh, the the uh, pyramids themselves are not burial free, that's their whole purpose, but uh, this uh, inclined plane would help. You notice, uh, again, the Egyptians are being careful with wood, but they put these in uh, so that they sort of run like the ties on a railway. And here's a man pouring water to serve as a, a lubricant. And you go uh, and you place the second layer on top of the third, and similarly the third on top of the fourth, and on and on. We actually believe that a ramp started at each corner. And you can see then that actually the bulk of the pyramid as the ramp slants inward with the slant of the pyramid, the pyramid provided part of the bulk needed for the ramp. So you have four ramps, two for bringing stones up, and the other two were free for bringing empty sleds down. We need to have a complete cycle here. And so now, uh, and I don't mean to minimize the, the labor involved, <clears throat> it's a matter of up and up until we reach the very top. And there uh, you put the capstone in place. And then there's still work for those skilled uh, stonemasons. They are going to take the, the limestones where, which were in large blocks and then cut them smooth or relatively smooth uh, as they go from the top to the bottom. 
we believe that that very capstone was originally covered with gold plate. So you'd have that golden pinnacle on top of this uh, white uh, pyramid. It must have been just absolutely startling. Uh, while all of this is going on, other craftsmen are building boats to put in the boat uh, pits. And here uh, we dismantle all of the scaffolding. We take away uh, all of the material for the ramps. We see that a, a smaller pyramid has been built. Uh, this was probably for the favorite wife of the Pharaoh. Uh, I, I hesitate to guess uh, why uh, hers is smaller. Maybe it was for the little woman, but I'm hoping my, my wife didn't hear me say that. But in any event, uh, this is the, the complex then. And all that's necessary at this point is for the Pharaoh to die. Now, the Pharaoh um, uh, would be cared for in a very, very elaborate embalming procedure. The brain was removed, uh, usually by removing it through the nose. Uh, and then the uh, corpse itself would be uh, cut open and they would put the internal organs into uh, three uh, specially produced jugs called canopic jars. And then they would put uh, material, um, essentially um, salt, uh, various salts in and around the body to dry it out. And the goal was to, to really withdraw all of the moisture that it was physically possible uh, from, uh, from the uh, Pharaoh's body, from the mummy. And when th that was done, then the body would be wrapped with linen cloth, uh, frequently soaked in resin. Uh, and they would also put in um, various uh, uh, miniature, uh, miniatures of gods and goddesses, various uh, uh, in effect, good luck charms. Uh, and then when all of that was done, they would bury the Pharaoh uh, in his pyramid. Now, as impressive as they are, not one of these pyramids withstood the grave robbers. Each and every pyramid of the old kingdom was robbed. And occasionally the priests would rebury the, the Pharaoh and the thieves would re-rob the pyramid and this cycle would go on and the priests simply gave up. The reason, of course, for the robberies was that the pharaohs were buried with uh, a lot of grave goods, a lot of valuable items uh, that, that he might need. And we'll talk about why he might need those in just a little bit. So we have no sense of how the pharaohs in the old kingdom were buried. But in 1922, a pharaoh from the, uh, the uh, New Kingdom, um, a pharaoh <clears throat> by the name of Tutankhamun, his tomb was discovered. Now, remember, he is well outside of the Old Kingdom period. He is hundreds of years later. And in fact, he was not a particularly important pharaoh. But in that particular burial, there were hundreds and hundreds of items found, gold uh, statuettes, silver mirrors, uh, chariots, uh, um, embalmed uh, uh, monkeys and, and other animals. <clears throat> so it is likely in the old kingdom, the pharaohs were laid away with similar uh, treasures. Now, why all of this concern about the burial? Well, for the Egyptians, the burial was important to protect the Ka on the journey from this life to the afterlife. Now, as close as we can come to what the Ka means is the soul. The Ka for the Egyptians was a spiritual force. And in effect, the Ka, as it made the journey to the afterlife, needed a physical vessel to return to periodically. And that physical vessel was our body and death. So this 
represents the reason of the Egyptians wanting to make the, the body as durable as possible so that it would last and last through this uh, period of death and this period of transition. Now, they didn't know if this took days or weeks or months, but nonetheless, that had to be uh, preserved. So they also asked themselves, what would the Ka, what would the soul need on this journey? And of course, it would need any number of things. It would need, for example, food. So we know that, that foodstuffs were buried in the pyramids. It, it may need games, or it may need uh, animals to amuse itself with, or it may need a chariot to go for a ride, or it may need whatever. It may need clothing and silver and gold and all of the rest of that. Of course, in the case of the pharaoh, could you expect the pharaoh's ka to sort of just walk to the afterlife? Well, this explains then the, the meaning and the purpose of the boats. The boats were buried in the desert so that they would be the vehicles that the ka could take on its journey to the afterlife so uh, that the pharaoh would not have to walk all the way there. Now, I want to talk for just a moment in, in closing about Egyptian mythology. Now, I, I, we use the term Egyptian mythology. And, and for us, mythology tends to mean what? Uh, Far-fetched or tall tales, you know, something like, say, the Paul Bunyan tales of, of Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox and all the rest of that. We don't believe that mythology was real. Uh, but for the Egyptians, this religion, I think, was a sensible religion, even though it may not make any sense at all to us. The Egyptians thought that all of this made sense. And they, 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 they would probably be offended uh, if, if we suggested <clears throat> that it was foolishness. Now, I want to tell you one story, and that is the story of the god Osiris. Now, Osiris is one of the most powerful of the gods of Egypt. He is the god of the afterlife. He is also the god of the Nile. It is Osiris who every year brings the flood. And of course, the flood uh, brings that life-giving water as well as a new layer of topsoil to ensure that the the valley is always rich in its soil. Uh, but, but Osiris was one of the most powerful and one of the most beloved of all of the gods. That, it, that is, Osiris was beloved by virtually everyone. And in fact, even the other gods, with the exception of Set. Set happened to have been Osiris's brother. And the more Osiris was loved, the more Set envied Osiris and the love that he got and Set did not get. And, and one day in a fury, Osiris, uh, Osiris was murdered by Set. Set had created a plan uh, to kill Osiris and he was successful, but killing Osiris was not enough. Set then set about chopping up his corpse into a hundred pieces, some, some, uh, some forms of the story say a thousand pieces, but a hundred will be good enough for now. And then he took those hundred pieces of his brother Osiris and scattered them uh, to the four corners of the earth. And that would seem to be the end of Osiris. But what's going to save Osiris? Well, uh, any man can tell you that what will save Osiris is the love of a good woman. And in this case, uh, it is his wife, Isis. Isis was married to Osiris and was just uh, heartbroken uh, at, at the, the killing of her husband. And so she set about gathering up these various pieces of her husband, uh, taking a long, long time to do it. And if you, you think about this literally, it gets to be a little 
ghastly. It gets to be a little uh, hard to imagine. But uh, in any event, she gathers them up and, and successfully finds them all except one. More about that later. And with the help of another god, Toth, she manages to bring Osiris back to life. Now, in effect, this is perfect because Osiris now knows life and death. Okay, he knows life and resurrection. Just as he brings life and death to the Nile Valley with the annual flood bringing life, and as it dries out death, it is the perfect symbol uh, of, of Osiris. Now, <clears throat> the, the son of, of Isis and, and Osiris, Horus, the hawk-headed god, uh, was furious uh, with, with his uncle Set and, and went to attack him. And in fact, uh, was, was about to overwhelm, Set was about to kill him when his mother Isis implores him not to kill his uncle, that there had been enough damage done. And so Set was allowed uh, to survive. But uh, it's just no, another example of what family doesn't have its problems. Now, you and I find these fascinating tales, but I think the Egyptians saw reality in them. Uh, they saw the fact that there can be conflict uh, among people and among people of the same family, that, that Osiris was the life giver and in fact was the fit judge of men because he had lived and died and understood uh, the joy of life and the fear of death. So all of this works together uh, to, to create for the Egyptians a sensible religion. By the way, this is just an example of a tomb chamber. This is from the tomb for um, uh, the, uh, it's a tomb for, anyway, it is the tomb chamber for, I'm sorry, it'll come to me uh, in a minute. But I want you to, to notice first this, uh, this depiction of Isis on the upper wall of the tomb. Uh, this is the funeral complex. I'm sorry, I am blocking on, on the uh, Pharaoh for whom this, it, it was uh, one of the few women to rule Egypt. Um, anyway, in, in the New Kingdom. But this is her funerary complex uh, set into the mountainside. Anyway, um, that, uh, that concludes my presentation and I wanna thank you for your time and your attention. Uh, Rochelle? Yes, uh, was it Hatshepsut? Hatshepsut? Hatshepsut, thank you, You're absolutely <laughs> right. I, thank you so much. I, yes, it was Hatshepsut. It's the only one I know that was a female ruler. <laughs> well, um, you were absolutely right. Well, of course, there's uh, uh, Cleopatra, but she's really Greek. Yeah, that's right? way later. She's not really way later. You're absolutely Egyptian, right. really, isn't she? More Greek. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I have a question. How did they smooth the sides of the pyramid? Did they they did it at the end, or was it as they were building it? Uh, they did it at the end. They they needed to do it at the end because you weren't exactly sure how each block would fit, and so they then used their chisels, uh, copper chisels, not not the very best uh, tools available, but they, they did it uh, when all of the stones were finally set in place. I had a question. The foundation for the pyramid, they couldn't have built on sand. No, so, they, uh, let me, they got this down to bedrock. Okay. It's built, it's built on bedrock. Okay. So yeah, once you get out of the valley, the bedrock isn't very far down. And they use part of this plateau here to actually supply the, uh, the internal blocks. So they, they didn't have to be transported very far. Um, one of the patrons said uh, Nefer Nefertiti. Um, yes. Okay. Was Nefertiti. also a female ruler. 
Yes. Okay. Um, so does anybody else have any questions or comments they want to make? How long did it take to make the big pyramids? The Great Pyramid took 20 years. Really? That's not that long. Jeez. Wow. No, 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 no. Uh, the, but, you know, 80,000 men could move a lot of stone in a four month period of time. That's why you needed the year round workforce to create the blocks. So basically, as soon as they became a pharaoh, they probably started building these things, right? If, if you were prudent, yes. <laughs> I had heard that, um, this is much later, obviously, in common, that he died younger so that they don't really think that maybe his tomb was supposed to be his tomb. Is that true or? There's a lot of debate about that. It, it may, he may have taken over the tomb of someone else. Um, but again, uh, there's, there's so little evidence um, of, of what a pharaonic uh, burial would look like that it's hard to say. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was, it quite possibly was not his tomb and that uh, they, they used someone else's tomb to, to put him in and, and the grave goods with him. Well, no one else is asking questions, so I'm going to just keep asking things I was sure. wondering about. Um, I know they are, they're now looking more in like the Valley of the Kings and stuff for tombs and stuff. Do you think there's ever going to be another major find like um, Tutankhamun or is that pretty much the one off? Uh, I, I think it's, I think it is possible that there can be another find. Uh, although remember that the grave robbers had tremendous incentive to find, uh, to find out where the, the pharaohs were buried. Uh, and what surprised me uh, when I read about it was how in, in the old kingdom, in the pyramidal burials, uh, they, they were found and reburied and, and the graves were robbed again three and four times um, until the, the priests finally gave up and uh, actually then, then uh, buried the pharaohs in bunches uh, in, uh, in the Valley of the Kings, I think. All right, so it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank you. Thank you. Um, I will send out an email to you tomorrow. Um, thank you for coming. Thanks everyone for coming. Don't forget next month we have another program. Weather's going to be getting nicer. It's going to be about places you can go to in Michigan. So that'll be great. Um, I personally can't wait to be able to go out and have some, do some stuff out in the nice weather. So everybody have a good evening and thanks a lot, Dennis. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much right. for having me. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.